Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here to our second issue briefing of the day. Welcome also to our audience watching us on our live stream platform, weforum.org. Now, very few issue briefings come up more topical than the, the one of currency shocks. It's been a rather busy week for that. I'm delighted to be joined by Lord Turner, who's a senior fellow of the Institute of New Economic Thinking based in the United Kingdom. We're going to start with, um, I'm going to start by asking Lord Turner to make some opening remarks on the, on the macroeconomic environment and the implications for currency. And then we'll take questions from the, from the audience and also from social media. So please do keep tweeting your questions through. Lord Turner, it's been a busy week, what with the uh, ECB news, uh, which is dominating and slightly, uh, slightly um, captivating every economic journalist in the building. Any remarks, any comments on uh, the macroeconomic environment? Well, I think the crucial thing is that separate from the day-by-day, week-by-week developments, we have to bear in mind what the overall global context is. And I think the overall global context is that we're still only slowly coming to terms with how deep is the deflationary impact of a large uh, debt overhang across the world. Since uh, 2008, uh, a crisis which was essentially produced by too much debt in the private sectors of the economy, we really haven't managed to get rid of debt. We've just shifted it from the private to the public sector or from the private sector in some developed economies to developing economies and, in particular, China. Uh, And I think we are at a stage where uh, the burden of that debt Uh, and the difficulties of escaping from the deleveraging attempts that comes out of that means that there are some very strong deflationary effects around the world, added to by labor market effects. So I'm struck by the fact that Abe Economics, which I support, I think it is the right thing to do, it really is not yet delivering the increase in inflation that it said it would. Uh, I'm very struck by the fact that the China slowdown, I think, is significant. I don't think it's going to produce a financial crisis, but I do think it's going to produce a significant slowdown in both China growth and China inflation. And I see that the latest figures on the surveys for manufacturing growth are down. I think if you look at the uh, producer price index, the retail price index, all of those are signaling down uh, in China. And I think People sometimes don't pay enough attention to China and realize what a depressive effect that is. I think all of that was creating a context uh, in Europe where the outlook for Europe was undoubtedly very slow growth and uh, very low inflation. And it's against that context uh, that we've seen uh, the ECB measures. I think it's the right thing to do. Markets have obviously responded very positively to it uh, today. Uh, But I still think it may be uh, uh, insufficient, really, to pull the Eurozone economy fully out of the deflationary cycle that it's in. And to bring this back to currencies, what I think this then creates is an environment where there are a lot of currencies around the world all trying to go down because they think that will help stimulate their economy. It's quite clear that the Eurozone thinks that one of the transmission mechanisms of quantitative easing and ultra-loose monetary policy uh, is a weak euro. But then you have the currencies around the edge of the euro, uh, the Swiss franc, uh, the Swedes, the Danes, all trying to limit any appreciation against the euro by moving into negative interest rates. We have Japan would like, again, part of its transmission mechanism of its extreme QE to be a somewhat weaker yen. But you then have uh, the Koreans worried if the yen goes down too much against uh, uh, the won. And if you talk to Chinese policymakers, they say, well, one of the things that they could do to uh, offset a, uh, a, a bigger than required or desired slowdown in China is it might be good if the renminbi went down. Now, not everybody can go down. Uh, There's a lot of people around the world faced with relatively deflationary times, slow growth, low inflation, believe that part of the transmission mechanism to escape from those problems is a low currency. And that can't be true for everybody. So I think we are in an environment where that means that the one currency of the country which is robustly growing, uh, the US, is likely to go up. But I think that will also place a bit of a headwind uh, against how fast the US develops. In a sense, some of the deflationary and low growth from other countries will be uh, a, create a headwind uh, to the US uh, through the, uh, uh, the appreciation of the currency. All of which says to me that we are still in an environment with interest rates around the world where they are staying lower for longer than even people have woken up to now. I think the only country where we're going to see an increase this year uh, is uh, the US, and I suspect that that will be very mild. But overall, we're still in deep 
potentially deflationary times uh, in which uh, a whole load of different countries around the world would rather like their currency to go down as part of the solution to that, but they can't all do it. It sounds like the new normal is currency volatility. I don't know how much volatility it is. I mean, interestingly, if you compare the volatility that we've seen recently, it's nothing like as much as we used to have in the early 80s. I mean, uh, uh, I remember first time I went to, lived in the US uh, in 1981. It was absolutely wonderful. It was 247 US dollars to the pound. And four years later in 1985, there were 1.05 US dollars to the pound. And then that, of course, produced the famous Plaza Accord, which was trying to place a, a, a limit on the decline of the, uh, 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 the dollar. And then we had the uh, dramatic appreciation of the yen, uh, the, the appreciation of the dollar. And um, then we had the uh, appreciation of the yen, which was seen as part of uh, the cause of the 1990 uh, crisis. So actually, although we, we seem to have a world of there are movements, there are very significant short-term spikes as people change policy, as we saw uh, with the Swiss franc. But what is intriguing about the modern world, a very significant financial crisis in 2008, is we have not seen the enormous swings in uh, a exchange rates, which were part of the pattern of uh, the, the 1980s. Uh, we'll take questions from the floor for Arnie. Okay, so let's just develop that the, yep. the, that you know for, for for a moment longer, and and look about resilience as well, because it's something you've you've talked about before in the past. Are our are our institutions resilient enough now to withstand any any further movements? Bearing in mind, you may think that volatility won't be won't be something we need to be too concerned about. Well, I think the major financial institutions of the world are much more resilient than they were six years ago. Uh, because of the very significant increases in capital and liquidity position, which were enforced by the regulation Basel III and regulation of derivatives markets, etc. So I think uh, we went through a crisis, and I remember people like Jean-Claude Trichet at the time saying one of the surprising things of the 2008 crisis was foreign exchange was the dog that didn't bark. I mean, you know, it, it played no role in the crisis. Nobody uh, ended up as a bankrupt bank because they lost money on the foreign exchange markets. Uh, and I think actually we have a more resilient system in its absolute core of you know the big uh, systemically important financial institutions so I would be very surprised if volatility in foreign exchange markets is a major driver of problems within the financial system itself. I mean, obviously, it may wipe out uh, relatively peripheral papers, uh, players, as we saw uh, with some of these retail forex brokers, uh, uh, which are either in trouble and one, one actually went bankrupt uh, uh, earlier this w week. Um, I think what we should be more worried about, actually, maybe not financial institution volatility, but uh, some exposures of large corporates, etc. What we know is that we have significant numbers of corporates in emerging markets, uh, which took uh, advantage of the opportunity of very uh, low uh, dollar rates to take out debt uh, in dollars. And obviously, if they have both an appreciation of the dollar and an increase in the interest rate, and if those dollars are not matched by uh, dollar export receipts or naturally arising dollar revenues, uh, but they've been taking simply a position, which I think many of them have, it's been, it's been a carry trade of, you know, borrow the dollar and a, uh, a invest either in local uh, financial instruments or in a, uh, uh, businesses with uh, local currency revenue streams. I think that's where we should look for some of the stresses that will come this year uh, with the appreciation of the dollar and a, some increase, I don't expect a dramatic increase, but some increase uh, of dollar interest rates. I expect it more in some subsets of the corporate markets, particularly in emerging countries uh, who've borrowed dollars uh, and, are, uh, and have unhedged positions. That's where I think we'll see a major stress. Go back to the landscape you painted at the beginning of this conversation with uh, um, almost all the major currencies looking to depreciate in value. As you quite rightly say, though, not everybody can do that. Who will be the winners and losers? Well, I don't know who will be the winners and losers. Well, I, I think the answer is some currencies will tend to appreciate versus the dollar. I mean, we've seen, of course, quite a significant uh, downshift in the, uh, uh, the, the euro against the dollar. That was occurring uh, in any case because of expectations of future interest rate movements. That has been reinforced by the QE program. And I suspect it will tend to be reinforced this year 
uh, as and when the Federal Reserve takes its first steps towards uh, interest rate increases. Uh, I think other ones are more difficult uh, to predict, but it's uh, clearly one of the hoped-for transmission mechanisms of the Bank of Japan's huge uh, QQE program uh, that they will keep the yen low. Um, I, I would be, you know, I, I always find these things very difficult to predict. I mean, my overall assumption would be that, on the whole, the yen and the euro, maybe also the renminbi, the won, sterling, will all most likely go down against the dollar. But of course, if they all go down simultaneously against the dollar, then the stimulative effect of that on their economies is somewhat muted because, yes, they're getting uh, an improved competitive position uh, versus American competitors, but Japanese are not getting an improved competitive position against German nor German against Japanese. So I think I would be very wary of suggesting that one knows within the, the relative ranking of all the different economies which would quite like uh, somewhat weaker currencies, uh, which will be more or less weak. Um, but the crucial point is, you know, if they all go down by an equal amount against the dollar, then the stimulative effect on their economies, you know, is, is more limited mm -hmm. than if one of them was able to go down against all the currency, all the other currencies in the world, which I think is much more difficult to achieve. And just staying with that scenario for, for, for a moment longer, what should be the priority of American policymakers? Well, I think the priority of American policymakers, and in particular the Fed, should be to meet their dual mandate. Uh, that's what they're legally required to do, and I think that's appropriate for them to do. And I think we now know that the U.S. has uh, fairly robust growth, both in output and in employment. My own gut feel is that this may take longer to translate into inflationary pressures than some people are imagining. Because if you actually look at the employment rate of the US economy, despite the good jobs growth of last year, two and a half million or so new jobs, uh, the employment rate is still well down on where it was in 2000. And so I suspect that as we tend to get an employment increase, um, more people will be brought back into the labor market. I think also there are many aspects of uh, uh, industry and service activity today which can be automated, and at the first time of wages going up, uh, there will be some of that will be offset by automation. So my own gut feel is that the feed through of a robust U.S. economy to uh, a, 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 any inflationary pressures. Uh, whether in uh, prices or in the labor market in wages, uh, will be relatively slow. And my suspicion, therefore, is that that will be reflected appropriately in a relatively slow pace of the uh, increase in interest rates. I would anticipate that sometime in the middle of the year this year, as the markets anticipate, there will be a an increase in uh, U US uh, a, a policy interest rate, the Fed funds rate. Uh, but because I think there is probably more slack there because of the underemployment, uh, low employment rate, because of the headwind of an appreciating uh, currency, and because in an environment where the rest of the world is growing slower, there's only so far that the U.S. can grow. Uh, my anticipation is that I would not expect a rapid return to high rates of inflation, and therefore I think the path of the increase of interest rates that the Federal Reserve will introduce uh, will be pretty gradual, and that by 2017 we may still be looking at U.S. interest rates, which are more like 2.5% than anything higher than that. Uh, we have a microphone here for the gentleman in the front row, please. Gren, we know you, but our audience don't, so please uh, give us your full name and uh, tell us where you're from. Hi, I'm Gren Manuel from Financial News in London. At the banking panel on Wednesday morning, I think the, the three big bankers that you had there, they all seemed pretty pleased the way the currency markets had handled the sharp <laughs> moves last week, even though I think on one day there was more than 10 billion traded, which is an extraordinary volume. The market, I think, that they were concerned about as causing a huge potential dislocation and potentially leading institutions to fail was the bond market and how that would react to potential rate rises in the US because of the lack of liquidity. FX markets, as we know, are incredibly liquid. They work very well. 
It was the bond market that we were worried about. As a former regulator, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I do agree that the FX market works uh, very well. It has a very uh, uh, well-developed ways of uh, doing settlement, taking away settlement risk. Of course, those were put in place several decades ago after the great problems which occurred with the Hirschstadt failure, etc. So it, technically, it's a market that works well. Uh, it's also a, a deep and liquid market. It can be volatile, uh, but people are able to uh, you know, position with it, within it and to, to, to lay off risk. And as I said, I mean, I don't think we have in those markets uh, people taking, you know, huge risks uh, within the banking system itself, within the trading books of the banking system, which uh, are suddenly going to crystallize into losses if one of them has gone the wrong way. I think, you, you know, as we saw last week with the Swiss franc, there's a whole load of individual retail investors who've been encouraged by retail brokers to take positions who've suffered large losses. But I think the more professional players at the core of the market have been uh, more cautious. As for the bond markets. I th my personal belief is that this issue of the withdrawal of liquidity may be somewhat uh, overplayed. Um, the argument is that a combination of the higher trading book capital that we have and also uh, the Volcker rule means that it is uh, more difficult and more expensive to be a market maker and take positions uh, in the bond markets and therefore to be a natural uh, counterparty. Uh, the reason why I'm always a little bit wary of those arguments that we we desperately need more liquidity in, in the bond markets is, of course, back in 2007, we thought we had lots of, uh, of liquidity in bond markets and securities markets. And then when we needed it, it wasn't there. Uh, you know, liquidity tends to be a, a, a fickle thing. Um, I'm not, I don't think we should overact to some of the events which occurred, you know, the, the spikes which occurred in uh, October. Um, and I mean, we shall see. Right? But there is no inherent reason why a world in which the U.S. gradually returns to, let us say, 2% interest rates while the rest of the world is pretty much stuck at zero, there's no inherent reason why that is also a more volatile world if it is anticipated. And I think it is anticipated. And broadly think, speaking, I believe that the path of uh, U.S. policy rates and of long yields will probably be pretty much what the market expects it to be at the moment, which is some sort of takeoff uh, in the middle of this year and then a very slow low increase thereafter. And if there aren't unexpected events, if simply uh, the market uh, evolves in line with what uh, uh, the swaps curve uh, says we should expect, uh, I think we somewhat overstate the idea that there's an inherent problem of a, uh, a, a, a world in which there is a differential of uh, interest rates between major currencies. Let, let's remember that throughout the 1990s and 2000s, uh, we had an environment where US interest rates were typically about 5% and Japanese interest rates were typically about zero. Uh, it didn't produce you know, disruptive uh, volatility in government, uh, uh, either US or, government or, or Japanese government bonds. So um, I accept the argument that there has been uh, less liquidity uh, in uh, major uh, bonds, but uh, I'm not absolutely convinced that this is a major risk to the financial system, and I'm not convinced that the mere fact that we return to a world in which one currency you know, has a higher interest rate than another uh, necessarily implies that there must be a high level of volatility. If you look at the volatility events of the last couple of years, uh, some of them, the ones in last October, seem to have been a set of technical causes that we don't really uh, understand, but the, the, it was pretty much a one-day wonder. Um, the, um, the famous taper tramper, a, a taper tantrum uh, of tw early 2013, May 2013, was because the market didn't anticipate it, and slightly odd that they didn't anticipate it, but uh, you know Ben Bernanke's words, for whatever reason, surprised them. Uh, I don't personally think that what the Fed does this year will surprise us. I think it will be pretty much what the market anticipates. Uh, what? Hillary. Yeah. Is this working? Yep. Hillary Jaffe. I'm from Business Day in South Africa, yep. Johannesburg. I wondered if you could spell out some of the implications of what you are saying for emerging markets and particularly who might be the winners and losers within the emerging market universe? Well, I think clearly the slowdown in the Chinese economy, which is essentially because the maturing and the ending of a credit and asset price uh, boom and an infrastructure and property boom, uh, is already 
to the disadvantage of the major commodity producers. And you know, we don't need to speculate whether that's occurred. That, that has occurred. I mean, the, the, the key fact, which I think a lot of people were ignoring till about six months ago and is now expressed in the commodity prices and along with supply factors in the price of oil, is that after 2009, China kept the economy going with an enormous credit boom, which drove the investment rate up from 40% of GDP to 50% of GDP. This investment was fundamentally in infrastructure, in railways, in property, in uh, convention centers, sports stadia, uh, museums, you know, every city in China saying that it was going to put itself on the map as the city that people wanted to go to. And, you know, it kept the Chinese economy going, but it was a particular form of, of stimulus. It was a stimulus which we can define essentially as a concrete pouring stimulus. And, you know, some people have calculated that China poured more concrete in five years than America did in the whole of the 20th century. I'm not quite sure whether anybody's actually checked that fact or whether it's become an urban myth that we uh, repeat. But it certainly poured a hell of a lot of concrete. And if you pour a hell of a lot of concrete and you build a lot of buildings, uh, you, you consume a lot of coal, you consume a lot of oil, uh, you consume a lot of energy, you consume a lot of steel, you consume a lot of iron ore. And what happened during uh, 2014 and the second half of 2014 is a very significant slowing of that, which we're seeing in falls in industrial production, falls in steel production, a, uh, and a sign that the Chinese government, although they want to maintain an adequate rate of growth, realize that they've got to switch off this machine uh, before it just has too high a level of leverage and too much wasted investment. But switching off a machine like that, there's no easy way to do it. You will end up you know, producing very major reductions in commodity prices. And we've seen that in the oil price, which is also, of course, driven by the shale revolution. But we've seen dramatic falls in iron ore, in coal, in copper. So the easy thing to say, and it's obvious already, uh, that what has occurred has been you know, bad for uh, the major uh, commodity uh, producers, and that you know, includes to a degree South Africa, it includes Brazil. Uh, among the developed countries, of course, it includes the Australian economy, which has slowed down uh, very significantly. So that's, that's the, the clearly uh, uh, straightforward bit of, of what has occurred. I think outside that, in the export manufacturing sectors, of a, a, a developing economies. Of course, it tends to be then much more specific to their specific competitive advantage. Uh, but overall, you know, the demand from Europe, uh, you know, has not been uh, developing rapidly. The demand from uh, Japan has not been developing uh, rapidly. Um, so th we have, in addition to a very clear and very strong a commodity price fall, which then drives down the currencies of the big commodity producers, we have a more generalized uh, fall, which we have seen in the uh, significant downgrades of uh, world economic growth, which have come both from the World Bank and the IMF within the last week. Okay, thank you. Uh, Great, you have another question, though, if we can fit yeah. one more in. One more Never in, mind. okay, yep. Hi, it's my experience that most currency forecasts are wrong. Do you agree? And why is it that it's such a difficult market for experts to forecast? Uh, most currency exports, expert, ex, uh, forecasts uh, by experts uh, are indeed wrong. Uh, and I'm pretty sure mine would be. I've managed to keep them sufficiently general that I hope they might be directionally correct. But you may say, I noticed I very carefully did not avoid uh, uh, being clear about uh, all the different bilateral uh, 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 pairs, because if I knew how to do that, uh, I'd be trading away and making myself a fortune, and I've never worked out how to do that. So why are they so wrong? Um, and you're quite right that even the huge swings which I described back in the 1980s, not many people you know, saw before they uh, occurred. Um, I think two things. One, it's inherently difficult to be sure about the shifts of relative to performance that change the fundamentals. But even more important, foreign exchange markets have a tendency, once they start moving in one direction, to exaggerate the fundamentals. But because that is a process essentially internal to the market, internal to self-reinforcing expectations, internal to the weight of money which is being put against a 
positions one way or the other. What those sort of things in markets are inherently difficult to predict. So in an environment where if it is believed that a currency is going to go up, and if it is believed that it is going to increase its interest rates, you basically have a set of carry trades uh, you know, of people borrowing the currencies which are going to depreciate, which are often also the currencies where the interest rates are very low, and putting money into the appreciating currency. That, because it's not a fundamental real economic phenomenon, like you know how much oil the world produces or what's happening to manufacturing competitiveness, it's something which has some strong self-reinforcing features. Um, and it's strongly developed, delivered, determined by you know expectations and exuberance, etc. So um, that can drive very significant uh, divergences, movements in currencies, which are far bigger than you would logically say were driven by uh, the fundamental economics. Though I do to return to the point I made earlier that relative to the size of the oscillations that we saw in the 80s and 90s, we have not seen those uh, recently. It's in the 80s and 90s that we really saw you know, self-reinforcing trends which were you know, way beyond what was required. I return to the point that between 1981 and 1985, the numbers of dollars to the pound went from 247 to 105. Uh, first of all, the pound had soared against the dollar between 1989, 1979 and 81, and then it went all, all the way back. And it's really very, very difficult to explain that fluctuation or the dollar-yen fluctuations uh, of the 1980s uh, on the basis of uh, you know, any theory of competitive advantage or relative inflation rates, etc. They are, there are strong self-reinforcing tendencies, but if anything, they seem to be less than they were back in the 1980s and 90s. Well, I think all financial markets are subject to irrational exuberance. I personally do not believe in the efficient market theory. I think we are staring uh, both in equity markets and in uh, uh, foreign exchange markets and in many markets the fact that they can overshoot you know, rational equilibrium levels and go to uh, extremes from which they come back. I mean, I think that is a generalized proposition uh, which has been well explained by you know, people like Robert Schiller about the way that markets work. And I think that is just a, a central fact of the way that markets work uh, across the world. Uh, we see that continually in, in, in equity markets. And as I say, we used to see that much more in foreign exchange markets than we have seen over the last several years. So, low inflation, low interest rates are likely to stay with us, as are the poor predictive powers of Forex experts. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Turner. Thank, Thank you. you all to our audience, here, both here and online. We'll see you back for another issue briefing shortly. Thank you.